Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Uh, today we're going to be doing a sommelier swatch with me video that is going to be a little bit different than my former swatch with me videos only because I really botched my first uh, first take of like the first third of the video. Um, I was working on this page here and completely messed up some of the colors over here along the way. I had like completely butchered numerous portions of the video and it was going to be a nightmare to edit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and redo this sheet, um, but I have company coming over tonight. So we're going to skip to my second page. We're going to go ahead and do that. I'll go ahead and work on redoing this page so we can swatch that over again and I'll share that with you second in this video. So, so it'll still be all of Sommelier's colors across page one and page two. We're just gonna do page two first. So the reds and yellows will come later in the video. We're gonna start with our blues, greens, and earth tones. And I think that catches you up to speed. So this video is brought to you by the wonderful generosity of Miss Otto, who you've heard me mention on the channel. She supplied me with the Schminka dot card for that swatch with me, and then she went ahead and made a swatch card uh, for Snellier so that we could try it out. The reason why Snellier doesn't have a dot card is because their paints are honey-based and they are very very, very sticky. So when I was going ahead and pulling off these plastic protective covers, um, there was a, a fair number of casualties along the way. What I have ended up doing is I've cut each of these rows into strips so that they were easier to kind of pull off and manage and so that I don't keep dragging my hand across a bunch of things. Um, but I just wanted to go ahead and give a huge thank you to Otto for going through the work for sending these out to me. I believe she sent them to a few other YouTubers as well. If you want to go ahead and check out one, I know that Harja Meeks already has her video up of the time lapse of her going through this and I believe that there will be another artist coming out with one perhaps in the future if she chooses to do so with her dot chart. Um, but so for today we're just going to go ahead and uh, show you all these colors. If you're not familiar with the Swatch With Me series, um, in this series we just go through all of the colors or all the colors that I have from a particular brand. We swatch them out, talk about their pigment numbers. If you'd like to see a full review on the brands, I'll put links in the video description below and you can go ahead and check out the reviews where I take a look at smaller sets of them and uh, kind of give you more thoughts on the overall paint rather than just a pure swatch with me video. As we go through this video I'm gonna have lots of other people to thank um, who help me kind of with different various aspects whether they know it or not um, and the first person that I want to thank is Caria from Coloring Caria who is a huge Sennelier fan who has offered to send me samples of Sennelier in the past and um, we hadn't ever worked out um, like specific colors that she was going to send for me to try out and then Otto surprised me with this full dot card so uh, I still want to give Caria a shout out for having offered to send me some samples and I'll put a link to her channel and her swatch through of her own full Sennelier set in the comments below in case you want to go ahead and see her take on it. Um, because lots of these wonderful YouTubers have been very generous with their supplies and sharing and I just want to make sure that everyone is given proper credit for doing so. So we're starting off here on our page two with Blue Sennelier, which is Thalo Blue Red Shade. It's PB15 colon six. And we're following that up with Thalo Blue, which is PB15 and there's no colon specified. So typically this would be like a PB15 colon three perhaps as we see next in the Cenarius Blue. That is the green shade of Thalo Blue, but since this isn't specified, we don't really know. The next person that I want to thank in this um, Swatch With Me video specifically for Sennelier is uh, Miss Jane Blundell who has an amazing, amazing blog. If you haven't seen her uh, vlog before, she has basically like every brand of watercolors you could possibly want to know about all cataloged on her website with um, swatch cards that are photographed, they're beautiful. and. Um, the reason I'm thanking her is because Sennelier doesn't have their pigment numbers on their chart and that makes it really difficult and very time consuming to have to go through like individual product links 
and pull all of the uh, pigment numbers. And so instead of doing that, I headed over to her blog and was able to look at, um, she's got several pictures, like she'll do this row, then that row of a bunch of the different pigments with the pigment numbers on them. So I used her blog to go ahead and save myself a bit of time. And I just wanted to thank her greatly for that uh, because it would have taken me forever to set up this chart without her resources that she's provided on her blog. So next up we have Cenarius Blue, which is PB15 colon 3 and PW4. And I have to say that I have not been kind to this color in the past. I don't like it, <laughs> um, but I know that a lot of other people do. And I suppose that if I look at this just as a light blue color, it's a nice color, like there's nothing wrong with it, um, but I think where my initial like dislike for it came from is that it's phthalo blue with white added to it. And because I know it's phthalo blue, I'm like, well, that's not as impressive as phthalo blue. It's just like muted down. But I know a lot of people use like using it for skies and things like that. And um, if you like it, I mean, no harm to you and feel free to keep using it. I know it's one of Sennelier's really like prideful colors. They put it in a lot of their sets. It's just not for me and that's okay. There's lots of other colors I like. Next up we have a color called Royal Blue, which is weird to me. <laughs> um, when I hear Royal Blue, I immediately, and like without any hesitation, think of a very rich dark blue color. And so I'm not really sure why they would call this Royal Blue. Maybe there's another meaning. And if you know the other meaning between this light, um, it's like a cornflower blue to me. Why this would be called royal blue, let me know in the comments below. Perhaps there's something in France's history that I am unfamiliar with that would deem this color that way. But this again is a phthalo blue. This is the PB15 colon six mixed with PW6 and PB29. So there's some ultramarine, some phthalo blue and a white. Um, next, we have some really interesting choices here. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think, okay, we have cobalt blue on the former page, the one that I'm going to be swatching second, so I apologize that this is coming first. It's not the order that I intended to record in, but I have cerulean blue here. But cerulean is typically made with like a PB36 or a PB35. And this is made from PB28, which is cobalt blue. So I'm not sure why they decided to use this pigment for this color. There is a cobalt blue, there is a cerulean blue, there's a cerulean blue red shade, and all of those are made with the same PB28. Um, there's also a cobalt blue dark that we'll take a look at, and that's made with a different pigment. But it just seems like an odd number. Odd, haha, <laughs> there's three of them. Um, but there is an interesting number of pigment or paints that use this pigment, and it's just a little curious um, given that they're calling it cerulean. I guess kind of cerulean like, um, although I would have to compare it to my swatch binder to really point out the differences. All right, I'm just gonna cover up my little strip here that I was working on so I don't drag my hand through wet paint. I'm gonna uncover our next row. And we'll take a look at that cerulean blue red shade. Um, in my first take of this video, I mentioned that uh, Sennelier's paints are very, very easy to re-wet and I will let you know if there's an exception to that. This cerulean blue red shade is probably the most difficult to get pigmented so far. And that's not saying that it was super, super difficult. Um, I've still had plenty of colors that took more effort to rewet than that, but just wanted to kind of let you know what's going on off camera. This is a really granulating pigment.
Yeah, I just don't know how I feel about it. I don't feel like these are different enough to warrant there being two different colors, and I don't know how they're going to compare to the other cobalt, so we'll have to wait and see and compare them at the end. One color I am excited about is this color called Turquoise Green. It's made with PG50, which is uh, cobalt teal in some other brands. Sorry if my paper is bouncing around a little bit. I propped it up so that there wasn't as much of a glare on it. I love cobalt teal. And I'm always excited to try it in new brands. It looks like theirs is going to granulate quite a bit, so it'll be nice to see how that dries. I'm trying to determine if my screen is too bright. I don't think it is. Gosh, I really hope after what a disaster my first attempt at this video was that the settings are right on the camera here. I got a new gray card, um, which if you're not familiar with uh, digital... Uh, either photography or video, it helps balance a camera's exposure and white balance. Your camera is always looking for something called a 17% gray. And so you might notice that if you take a photo of something that's white, it takes it darker because it's thinking that that white is supposed to be gray and is, is making it as such. And so by focusing your camera using that 17% gray card, you can try and get a balance uh, that will properly expose and set the color contrast. So I'm actually going to do this real quick on screen. I hope you guys don't mind. I just want to make sure you guys are getting the right, um, the right exposure here. And you might have seen that change just a little bit there. It got a little bit darker, I think. And I do want to do my white balance too, just to make sure, but I can't do that when it's recording. So hold on one second. All right, it looks pretty much the same in the viewfinder. So <laughs> hopefully it is in fact correct. And I hope you didn't mind that little behind the scenes look there. Um, so that next color we did is cobalt green and that's PB36. It's a beautiful, beautiful greenish teal color. I'm really excited to try using that more in paintings and seeing what I can come up with. This next one is Thalo Turquoise. It's always a favorite of mine, and theirs is beautiful. This is just Thalo Blue and Thalo Green mixed together. But it's this beautiful, vibrant teal. Very dark, very rich. Because it's made with two Thalo colors, it definitely is going to stain. But you know, some colors are just worth worth the trouble of not being able to lift them. Forest Green is next, and I quite like Forest Green. I have this in my, um, my 14 pan set that I did the review on. It's made from PBK7, PG7, and PY42, and it's this super rich dark green. It reminds me a lot of PG-8, which isn't as common in watercolors. Um, it's said to be a bit fugitive, but White Knights has it, and it is in my top um, top ten or top ten top five top five. <laughs> Can't even remember. I just did the series. My top five favorite green colors. It um, toddy green the the PG-8 made that into that video. And I think I mentioned this forest screen as being a favorite convenience screen, but I can't remember for sure. It's a beautiful color. Then we've got Thalo Green Deep. And if I remember correctly, and let me just give a glance here. Yep, Carrie mentioned in her swatch through video that it's very odd that Sennelier does not offer a single pigment PG7. On the first page, I have some other colors to point out that it's interesting that they don't carry, um, like they don't have a PY65, which is uh, Hansa Yellow Deep. 
they have some alternatives, but they don't have a single pigment, which is just interesting. For all intents and purposes, this just looks like PG7. There's a tiny bit more blue in it from that phthalo blue. I don't know, typically when you're given a list of pigment numbers, it's because the first one is more prevalent, like a like um, ingredients in a food that you'd buy at the store. It starts with the most, most heavily used ingredient and kind of goes down. Um, but there's a couple instances where I was writing these through and that does not seem to be the case. There's definitely not more blue in this than green and there's another one further down. Um, I believe in the green section. But anyway, it's a pretty color. A little bit bluer than a phthalo green blue shade typically is, but uh, it's, an, it's a nice one. Then we've got Viridian, which is also a mixture. It is not PG-18 by itself, which is the true Viridian, and it's not PG-7, which is what some companies use as a Viridian hue. This is a combination of both. So we should see, in theory, we should see some granulation from the PG-18, and we should see some more intensity from the PG-7, which I already start to see here. And you know, this has the potential to be a nice version of this color because Viridian is really hard to re-wet, but Thalo Green is really intense and kind of a natural, so I don't know, I'm not sold immediately on this first swatching, but maybe it'll dry really nicely. We can see how that goes. They do have um, a single pigment PG36, which is Thalo Green Yellow Shade. They actually have two versions, but I believe pretty strongly that one of them contains some white. Oh my gosh. You can just hear, you can hear the uh, <laughs> pigment sticking to that piece of plastic. All right, so emerald green is listed as being PG-36, but there's got to be white in here, which they don't have to use, they don't have to list if it's used like as a filler, but it's strange because a lot of their other pigments list when there's a white in them. So I'm not sure why they wouldn't list it here. This is a, I would call it like a sea foam green. It's definitely green rather than teal, but it's got a little bit more opacity to it than a plain PG-36. And we can compare that directly to the PG-36 that's going to sit next to it. This is what they call Sennelier Green. They have a green yellow shade see it's super transparent, very, very bright, vibrant, very spring greeny type of color. And yeah, those colors are just so different. And I don't think that's just a like, oh, we treated this one differently. I could be wrong, but in my experience, it looks like it has white added to it. Then we've got Cadmium Green Light. And this is made with Thalo Green, PG7, and uh, Cadmium Yellow, PY35. So it looks like it is semi-opaque. I mean, sorry, semi-transparent rather than semi-opaque. It has a lot of the luminosity of a phthalo green, but then is kind of muted down a bit with that cadmium yellow. Of course, if you wanted to mix this color, you could, but they do have three different versions of that PY35, which we will see after this uh, page, of course. Um, and so I'm not sure which version they use there. I would imagine one of the more lemon versions because if it were a warmer version of that color, it would be a little bit more muted. Hooker's Green, 
came off in a giant blob, like more than half of it is on the plastic. <laughs> uh, but this is PY83 and PG36. It's a very bright green. Again, I would say that this would fall in a spring green category. Probably even more so than the PG36 on its own. It's got a little more yellow to it. Still not a color that I would use straight off of my pan or palette. Next we've got Chromium Oxide Green. This is PG17. This is going to be a very opaque kind of grass green color. It's really heavy, but it is a nice hue. A little on the flat side, like there's not a lot of glow to it. And then we have Green Earth, which is probably going to be difficult to re-wet. It usually is, so I'm actually going to let a dollop of water sit there, and we'll come back to it in a second. And let's go ahead and take our sap green here. This is Ultramarine Blue and PY153 for our yellow. It's interesting that's not the combination that uh, is often found in a sap green. Typically they're made with phthalo colors, but sap green is not a color per se. It's not a paint or a pigment. It varies tremendously from brand to brand. All of you guys already know my favorite version is Daniel Smith. This one, it's a nice hue. It has the potential to dry with some nice granulation, which most sap greens don't usually have. So we'll see what that looks like once it dries. That finishes up that row, so let me just go ahead and flip that protective sheet over and we'll go to the next line. You know what? This one has a lot of paint on all of these so I'm just going to pull this on over. <laughs> we can use it straight onto the sheet here. This first one is olive green. This is PY150, so that's Nickel Azo Yellow, PG36, which is Thalo Green Yellow Shade, and PBR23, which is a brown. This, um, this is more sap greeny than I've seen a lot of olive greens, which I like about it, but definitely more yellow than a typical sap green. So what I'm trying to say is it fits somewhere between a sap green and an olive green, and I really like this color, actually. Um, it's a little bit reminiscent of Daniel Smith's, uh, what is it called? Oh my gosh, why am I blanking? Green gold. They call it green gold. Um, that's not the typical, like, green gold with, made from PY129. It's a combination of colors from Daniel Smith that's a very, like, bright spring greeny color. Here. I can just show you. <laughs> it's this color here. It's very similar. Then we've got Thalo Green Light, which is PG7 and PY153. Um, it's going to be a bright green. You guys know my thoughts on bright greens. They're fine, like I don't have a problem with them. They're my boyfriend's favorite color, so I have to like them to some degree, right? <laughs> um, I don't keep them on my palette though. I think they're way too easy to mix to justify an entire well space to. You can very easily make this with a phthalo green and a middle of the road yellow, so. I don't see a point in having it on your palette, but if you use it a lot, you could do that. I realized here that I forgot Green Earth, so I'm going to come back to my dot card 
and it looks like it is ready to go. This is a very pale kind of greenish gray color. It's never going to have a ton of intensity. I honestly have no idea how they make it from PBR7. I've seen that in a couple different brands and I'm like, uh, I, I don't know because this is typically a brown color. I don't have a ton of experience with it. Um, you can see though here with Sennelier's version, like there's a lot of binder in this. And it is not, like, I cannot get it darker. That's, I can't. I've put so much paint on it already. <laughs> um, there's so much binder. Like, I took that straight off the middle of the dot and it didn't do anything. I've heard that type of color is good for um, mellowing out skin tones. Like, you use it to balance the reds and oranges and skin tones but I haven't practiced that myself yet. I don't paint very many people. All right, next we have bright yellow green. I wrote the name here wrong. This is once again, phthalo green and a yellow. This is the other one that I was talking about, um, similar to the phthalo, hmm, was it phthalo green deep? Yeah, because there's more green in there than the blue. Um, there's absolutely, without a doubt, more yellow in this combination than there is green. Thalo Green is an incredibly, incredibly high tinting color. And so you would never be able to get this color if you had mostly green in it and a little bit of yellow. So I would categorize this as a PY3 and then PG7, but I'm not sure. Um, it's very, very light. I'm trying to get it as dark as I can at the top of that swatch there. So another one that like you can mix it. I usually have those two colors or two very similar colors on my palette anyway, so I'm not going to dedicate a well space to that color. All right, next we have brown green. This is their this is Azo green, so PY 129. It's kind of an olivey color. A favorite from Steve Mitchell at the mind of watercolor um, in M. Graham it's called as a green I don't know how it compares to that color yet I have not seen M. Graham's version in person but I think that'll change soon so hopefully I'll be able to share that with you okay this next color I have some interesting information on and again I want to give a shout out to Caria because um, her video pointed this out and then I was able to do more research on it which was really cool because I've seen other people do swatch with me videos and they're like why on earth is this called brown pink um it is not pink at all and Caria mentioned in her swatch through video that back in the 1400s and I was able to verify this information as much as you can online right <laughs> um pink used to be like a muddy yellow color and it wasn't until the 1600s when I was doing research on this that I found out that pink kind of changed to mean what we know it as, which is a light red with white added to it. Um, so thank you to Caria for bringing that up that in the 1400s that yellow was called uh, pink. And then I was able to do that further research on it. Um, I don't know how accurate this is, but what I was able to find out from it is that it was, I believe, Queen Elizabeth I who had a fascination with carnations that were a light red color with like a white base tone. And there was something with the translation or the, the language back then, the way that the petals were shaped, that word I think was pinked, the way that they were crimped, and then they started calling them pink carnations, and then it eventually changed into be what we know it as today. Um, I also found out in that same article, I'll, li I'll link the article down below, um, it was really fascinating to read about it, that pink has tons of definitions. Like there is not just one definition for pink, that there, there's so many different meanings for that word. So I thought that was really, really interesting. 
And um, thank you to Caria for sending me off on that journey about brown pink. Um, it's made with nickel as a yellow, phthalo green, blue shade, and again, PBR 23. So very similar to this olive green, actually, except use PG7 instead of PG36. And there's definitely more of the yellow in here than in this version. All right, next we have French ochre. This, this is a really odd one, you guys. There are four pigments in this color, and I don't know why. Um, it's PY3, PY150, PBR23, and PBR7. Um, none of those are PY42 or PY43, which traditional like yellow ochres will come from. I don't know what purpose this color serves that makes it justifiable to have four pigments in it instead of just using a different color. I mean, it is different than an ochre. It's not quite the same, but it is very similar to like, um, like an, You know, I'm probably never going to remember to edit that part out. Hopefully I will. But what I was trying to say is that this is very similar to a nickel azo yellow um, with a little bit more green undertone to it. But I'm not sure. Not sure why they felt the need to add in all these other colors to it. And finally, from this little strip here, we've got light yellow ochre, which is made from PY42, which is your typical yellow ochre. And then they also added PY150 to it, which is that nickel azo yellow. This is a pretty color. It's definitely an ochre. If you didn't tell me that there was a PY150 in it, I wouldn't have known. So that always kind of brings the question to me, like, why was it added? I guess there's a tiny bit more of a glow to it than a typical yellow ochre would have, but it's very, very similar. All right, cover up that row. And on to the next. This row has some interesting colors in it. We're going to have to go between this plastic and our swatch card. The first one is yellow ochre. And this is the plain PY43. My whole dot came off though, so pardon me while I try and make sure not to smear this around the page too much. That's actually a beautiful yellow ochre. Um, we were just talking about this in the swatch with, or I'm sorry, the color spotlight recap. I did a color spotlight on this color. If you missed it, it was part of a collabs uh, channel swap with Sadie Saves the Day and um, I'll put a link to that either in the description or up here if I remember um, where this is like a this is a staple I can't get rid of it I try to make a palette without it and I need to have it with me and I am very very picky about my yellow ochres I really only like Daniel Smith's and uh, Windsor Newton and there's a couple other that are good that I don't use as much um, this is beautiful, and I would put it right up in the list with my Windsor Newton and Daniel Smith. Um, it's not too opaque. It's a really gorgeous color. There's granulation. There's texture to it. We were talking in Eve's stream earlier today, which will be in the past for <laughs> you guys watching this video once it goes up, but um, someone was asking what color I would add to this particular palette that Eve was working on, and I said yellow ochre, and... Um, we had some other people talking about how you can mix a yellow ochre hue, which you can do with brighter colors and more transparent colors, but it, you can't replicate this texture that it has. And for me personally, that's a deal breaker. Like I need that texture and my paintings felt so incomplete without it. Um, like I had the hue right, but it just lacks so much character. So that's my personal thought on that color. All right, here we've got golden ochre. This is a beautiful color. 
It's a three pigment color. This is PY119, PY42, and PY83. So you've got two different yellow, uh, well, technically three different yellow pigments. One of them is yellow ochre. The other two are other versions. Trying to build up a little bit in that um, upper tone there. Then we've got their version of quinacridone gold, which I'm going to take off of our little plastic here because there's plenty of it. This is PR101, PY150, and PR206. This is different than a lot of the other quinacridone golds that are made with PO48 these days and um, what's the other one? Oh my gosh. Huge brain fart, guys. PR101? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> um, this definitely looks like it leans a little bit more orange, but these versions of quinacridone gold hue change a lot as they dry, so we'll have to see when it dries uh, what it looks like. All right, then we've got burnt sienna, which I don't think I have enough of on the plastic, so let me pop on over to my little dot. In general, I have to say in the past, I have not been impressed with Sennelier's Earth Tones. Um, so far, they've been okay, although I might be eating my words on this yellow ochre. It's actually drying more opaque than I expected it to be. Um, I thought it would dry with more transparency, so we'll have to see on that one. The hue of this is beautiful, though. Here we have a Burnt Sienna. It's got like a very reddish orange tone to it. It doesn't feel as brown as I like my burnt siennas to be. But it does re-wet better than I remember. You know, hold on a sec. I don't remember that looking like the burnt sienna that I have in my pan set. So I'm going to pull out a little piece of scrap paper, and I'm going to pull out my set. This is Burnt Sienna here. It's hard to re-wet, and this looks more brown to me. At least in the pan. Okay. I guess... I guess it's similar, but this still feels more brown to me. Like, I don't know... This has more like a brown-yellow undertone. This has more of a red-orange undertone. It's very slight, and I don't want to be nitpicky, but they do seem different. And I know that they use different formulas for their pans versus their tubes, but I don't know why the color would be different. So that's curious. I'll have to come back to that. All right. Um, here we've got Permanent Alizarin Crimson, which was one of the mini blunders of the first take that I did. There's several versions of this, and then I painted it in the wrong spot, and yada, yada, yada. But um, they have three different versions of Alizarin Crimson. This one is um, a single pigment, PR206, so they put it with the earth tones instead of with Sorry, I'm trying to get this to straighten out here for you. And uh, they put this with the earth tones instead of the reds. Which is interesting because they put Venetian red in with the reds instead of the earth tones. <laughs> so I don't know what their thought process is with how they order things on their sheets here. But this is going to dry a bit more brown. I can't remember if I told you in this take or if it was in the first take, so I apologize if I'm repeating information, but um, in case you're wondering, I'm using a Grace Art Practice brush and Arteza watercolor paper for these swatches. Um, if you are new to watercolors and uh, wondering what to spend your money on, I always recommend spending your money on your paper first, your paint second, and your brushes third. Um, because these brushes, you can get them in a pack of like 12 or something for like $9. And typically cheap brushes will shed and lose a lot of hair and they won't be as beautiful or whatnot. But these hold a great point and um, I really, 
I really enjoy working with them. Okay guys, this next one is one that I hear a lot of people talking about. It used to be made from mummies. Actual mummies. <laughs> um, it's called Caput Mortem. And I don't believe it's made from mummies anymore. It's listed as PR 101. Um, it's a really sticky, like crazy messy, doesn't travel well color. And I haven't tried it before, but I know a lot of people think very highly of it. This looks like a really deep Indian red to me. I've seen a similar hue in other brands. It's really pretty. And I am excited to maybe try this in some mixes with the little dot that I have here. That'll have to be off camera though, because this video is going to be long enough as it is. Very pretty. I like it. All right. We've got Payne's Gray here. And I don't know why they plop these blacks in like the middle. It's very strange. They've got Payne's Gray Neutral Tint. Then we do some warm brown colors, and then we've got a bunch of grays, lamp black, ivy black, and then raw sepia, which is another brown. Like, I, I don't understand the order of Sennelier's chart. Uh, Otto was just putting this in order at Sennelier did, which I appreciate because it was easy to line up all the information, like with Jane's blog and everything. Uh, but I do not understand how they put these things in order sometimes. <laughs> and if you guys have an idea of why they put them in like a non-spectral order, I'd be so curious to know. I think Schminka has done the best job of that that I've seen on their swatch cards. They're really good about keeping like spectral order and then they follow up with the earth tones. And this one has been mostly okay, but I have disagreed with a couple placements so far and there's definitely some on the first page as well. All right, so I'm gonna take my cover, put it back, and we are on the last row of the dots. So we've got about a little over two more rows on our chart here. And we don't have enough on here for all of them, but we do have some. Sorry if that was loud. I'm trying to shift our paper up so you can see everything. This first one is gonna be the neutral tint. And if I remember correctly, their neutral tint is a bit on the purple side, which I always thought was funny for neutral tint. Uh, in a lot of brands, it leans one direction or another. Um, like in Daniel Smith, it leans a bit towards blue. This is made from PB60, PBK7, and PR209. I know that's gonna get covered up there. Sorry, I didn't talk about Payne's Gray either. That's made from PV19, PV15, colon 1, and PBK7. So you can see here that the Payne's Gray is much more blue. The neutral tint is much more purple. Once again, we need a prop, but we can put it a little further back this time so it's not at a harsh angle. Okay, now this one I have some reservations about. We'll see how it dries, but that does not look like Van Dyke Brown to me. That is way too warm to be a Van Dyke Brown. In every other brand, Van Dyke Brown has been a very dark, um, like ranging between a raw umber and a sepia tone. So I don't know what color this is, but it's not Van Dyke Brown. <laughs> it's pretty. It's a nice, rich, um, let's see, it's a PR101 and PBK7. But I'm going to question their naming there, for sure. Then we have a warm sepia. This is what I would expect out of a Van Dyke Brown. Oops, too much water. 
And this is a very warm sepia. I actually like this because sepia is a bit too cool for my liking, typically, but this is a nice one. It's made from PBR7 and PBK7. But you can get this dark tone from just a PBR7, so I'm not sure why adding the extra black unless you don't have access to a supplier who has the darker version of that color, maybe. All right, I have to go over to my dot cards for the rest of this row. We've got Raw Umber up next. This one's a little tricky to re-wet. Now, I had... I'm pretty sure it was Sennelier. I could be misremembering this. Eve can confirm for me. I sent the tube to her. Um, I tried to get Raw Umber in Sennelier and add it to my palette. And I ended up not loving the way that it dried in the palette. Um, I believe she already had that color but used it and so I sent it to her because it worked for her. But as I mentioned, I don't like um, kind of like the cooler browns and I'm not a big fan of like the greenish browns either, which this definitely falls into that category of. I like a little bit darker raw umber a little bit cooler raw umber. So I ended up switching to core myself. It also does not seem to want to really move. We're not a flowy color. It also dries really um, hard and crackly in the pan, which was not typical of their other colors. I can show you in this palette here. Like this is a tube color here, and this is a tube color, and they dry like really juicy. And the raw umber was just like in pieces and crackly and everything. Um, again, I could be misremembering the brown, but I'm like 98% sure it was a raw umber. Next we have raw sienna, which should be, whoops, sorry, I bumped the camera. This should be a like a brownish yellow ochre type tone. It's again a little bit difficult to work up off of the page, but it does appear to be what I would expect this color to look like. It's a little bit more opaque than I would expect it to be. Typically people will have either raw sienna or yellow ochre on their palette, but not both. Again, going back to my love for yellow ochre, I don't feel like this is an acceptable replacement because typically the raw siennas are going to be more brown, whereas I like my yellow ochres to be a little bit more yellow and a little richer in tone. So I just don't feel either of these colors flow nicely and it was really hard to get a smoother wash. Like these ones were super effortless. These ones are going to be patchy when they dry. Then we've got Burnt Umber. Burnt Umber is a favorite dark tone of mine. Again, hard to re-wet. It's releasing pigment, but slowly. All of these here, as you can see, are PBR7. If you are not familiar with PBR7, I get this question a lot across a lot of different videos. Go ahead and check out my Burnt Sienna Color Spotlight video from the first run of Color Spotlight. Um, I talk a little bit about the differences between those four colors that are all traditionally made with this single pigment. So you've got Burnt Sienna up here, and then these four, or these three. Um, so it's Raw Sienna, Burnt Sienna, Raw Umber, Burnt Umber. And that video explains a little bit about why they're different. Once you can get enough of this pigment worked up, it's a good tone. Um, it's a little lacking in like its depth, but it's okay. It's not terrible. Then we've got Transparent Brown, which is PBK7 and PR101. This is going to be, I can tell already that this is the the transparent orange version of PR101 rather than the thick opaque version of PR101. I like this, but 
I prefer Permanent Brown from Daniel Smith, which is P uh, PBR 25, which is um, a much more red, transparent version. I prefer this actually to their Burnt Umber. If I was going to have a dark brown on my palette for Sennelier, this would be it. I know it's a multi-pigment. I don't know how it mixes yet, so that might change my answer a little bit, but on just like initial first impressions, I like that way better than the Burnt Umber. And the more I look at Burnt Umber next to that color, I don't like Burnt Umber anymore. <laughs> um, first impressions can always be misleading, and so I really try and avoid like giving a final decree on like whether or not I like colors in the very, very first bit because my opinion is going to change and the more I use them or compare them next to other colors, that might change. So I already knew going into this that I wasn't a big fan of the earth tones and then I was like considering like, oh, maybe this is fine and then seeing it next to the other color, I'm like, oh no, I like the other ones better. Um, now that these have dried too, like these are very similar in hue. This one's a bit redder and doesn't granulate as much as this one does, but like they're very similar. I don't know. And then the warm sepia and the transparent brown are also similar, but this one is cooler. It's really interesting. I'm trying to look to see if I have it close by. Might be a little clunky. Let me see if I can show you this. You guys know I love earth tones, and a huge reason of why I love Daniel Smith is the number of earth tones that they have, because if you look at this, these are like all the earth tones we have, uh, with the exception there's a sepia down here too. That's it, for Sennelier. This is Daniel Smith's selection of earth tones. Like it's, they have an entire page in their four page spread of different earth tones ranging from yellow to red to dark brown. And, um, I think that's kind of how they stole my heart to begin with. <laughs> um, but I just love the variety, and a lot of people think that, oh, Daniel Smith has too much variety, there's too many... Uh, there's too many options there. I love how many options of earth tones I have because I'm really picky about my earth tones, and I get to pick whatever the heck I want from them, and I love that. I think it's great. What Snellier does have that's interesting is a wide range of grays. So, let me, oh God, this Kaput Mortem is just so sticky. All right, our first one is Warm Gray, and these grays do have a lot of pigments in them, but I really like the tone of this color, and I haven't seen it from another brand really. Um, Holbein might have a color like this. I can't remember. But this is PW6, PY42, PBK11, and PR101. Probably not a color I would ever own and keep on my palette, but this reminds me of like a dove gray. I worked with um, some ring neck doves at the zoo that I worked at, and this was the color of their body. Like that, that is perfect for the color that they were. So, and if that is dove gray, then we've got a pigeony type gray or an elephant color here coming up next with Sennelier gray. This is PW6 and P, BK9 and PG17. Interesting. So the chromium oxide green is in here along with a black and a white. So we're going to be pretty opaque here with both the opaque green and the opaque uh, white. It does also have, whoop, okay, down, down goes the brush. If you are avoiding ivory black with PBK9 due to animal products, um, which, you know what, that probably shouldn't matter to you, maybe, I don't know, it's your decision. <laughs> Sennelier is not a vegan friendly brand anyway, they have honey in their paints, but PBK9 is specifically made from animal bones, so if you have an issue with that, um, just want to point that out. Uh, I think, 
it's in that gray, it's in the lamp black, which I don't like that. Uh, lamp black is supposed to be a vegan friendly color, typically, unless there's honey in the paint. And then we've also got ivory black with PBK9. I'm trying to see. I don't remember off the top of my head if the other ones had that pigment in them. I think those are the only ones so far. Anywho, we're on to our last row. Here we've got a color called Greenish Umber. Um, it's really like a greenish gray color. And it actually reminds me a bit of a perylene green. Except it's three pigments. It's PB60, PBK7, and PY83. But I could easily see, like, if you only use Sennelier and you want to know what the fuss about perylene green is, this is probably as close as you're going to get. If you're in Europe, though, Schminka carries a perylene green. If you're in the U.S., Daniel Smith carries a perylene green. So unless you really only have access to Sennelier or really just prefer Sennelier, I would recommend doing the single pigment. Okay, light gray, we're gonna have to work at here. Uh, see, there's paper stuck, so I just wanna make sure that I don't pull the paper up with the gray. I might have to take it back. This might be pigeon gray. And our Sennelier gray would be like elephant gray. I'm just gonna assign animals to all the colors. How does that how does that sound? Yeah, this is pigeon gray, for sure. It's got that blue undertone. It's made from PW6, PB29, which is ultramarine, and PBK7. Okay, I actually really like that color. I do. And if I was ever painting a pigeon, I would want that color. I like it a lot. I'm having like... I wouldn't call it a crisis or anything. But like, I don't have gray on my palette. And I don't typically see a need for that. But I really like this color. It's so pretty. Who would have thought... Denise from In Liquid Color who doesn't like multi-pigment mixtures on her palette, liking a multi-pigment gray color. Hmm. All right, so earlier I said lamp black. Um, it's really weird for it to be made with ivory black. Um, it's called lamp black because you use the pigment PBK6 is a pigment that comes from like burning a lamp against like a piece of glass or something. Uh, you'd see that in your home. I don't know how they actually do it in manufacturing, but that black soot that you see is what they make that pigment out of. So to call this lamp black and then just be like, ah, oh, JK, we're gonna go ahead and use PBK9 anyway and then just add some yellow ochre to it. It's a weird decision. And for people who do wanna stay away from PBK9, I don't like that, but I'm not forced to use this brand. It's always my biggest thing is that when people criticize brands or like I'll do a review or something and people are like, oh, I don't understand the point of this brand, like just use this other one or I don't like this quality of this brand. Why do people use it? Like, who cares? Like we have so many different options and just find one that you like and it doesn't matter if someone else likes it. It's, it's the same thing with anything in life. I feel like I'm just such like a peacemaker. I want everyone to be happy and as long as you're not hurting someone else like who who cares what you believe in or what you want to paint with you know I'm trying to like <laughs> explain here that if there if there's certain things that you do or don't like about a paint like you have that option and you also have other options um luckily there are so many different brands and I do apologize for those of you who live in countries that it's hard to acquire more than one type of paint like I understand the, the problem there and that can be really frustrating and I do apologize but for those of us who do have access to multiple brands. There are multiple things that we can choose from, right? 
I know like some people don't like that Rembrandt is really shiny. It's like, like okay. Some people do like that, so that's fine. Some people don't like that Daniel Smith are harder to re-wet. Um, in climates that are more humid, though, they're not that hard to re-wet. Some people don't like that M. Graham are too sticky, but in dry climates like the one I live in, they're totally fine. So it's nice to have options, and I just want everyone to get along, to appreciate each other, to appreciate our, our differences and our choices, and it's all going to be fine. Okay, I understand why they put this raw sepia with the blacks. It's definitely more black than it is brown. And it's certainly different from this warm sepia, so that could justify having the two different ones in their line. Sorry, I hit the water cup. <laughs> um, it's made from PBR7 and PBK7, which is actually the same two pigments as the warm sepia, but there's probably a lot more black in this one. I say probably, like it's definitely has more black, but I'm not a pigment maker, so I don't want to put words in their mouth. I still don't understand why Payne's Gray and Neutral Tint are up here. They should be down here with the rest of them. But that is page two of our, well, just dip my finger in the, in the color chart. That was great. Uh -huh. Anyway, that was page two of the sommelier. We have not done page one yet. Uh, we will be doing that in the second half of this video, but there's going to be a break for me in between the two because, again, I have company coming over. I'll redo that chart and be back in like one second for you guys, and I'll see you on the other side. All right, everyone. Good morning. It is the next day, for me at least, and um, we're going to be going through the first page of the sommelier that I wrote up here. Uh, my voice is still warming up, so it's going to be a little froggy for a while, but hopefully it'll get a bit better. Although I do have to say, I didn't get much sleep last night, and then I wanted to have some tea because my throat was bothering me, and the only tea I had was the sleepy time tea, which probably wasn't a great idea when I was already tired. So I am feeling pretty chill right now. And uh, hoping that my energy is okay for the video. Um, so we're going to be starting off here with the yellows. And the first one here is a little bit of an odd color. It's uh, nickel yellow, which um, can be called rutile yellow, I believe in Schmincke, or um, nickel titanate yellow. And it's a nice color, but Sennelier's seems really weak, even for how light this color tends to be. So it was like that on the first page that I did. Let's see here. You can see the second swatch I got was a bit darker, but on the first swatch I had a really hard time getting anything up. I do think that there's a little bit of extra binder on this particular swatch that I have, so that might affect it as well. Uh, it's made from PY53, and uh, we're just going to keep moving along. Next is a really common one. This is Lemon Yellow, made from PY3, and um, you're going to find this in most brands, if not every brand, and it's a really bright, cool yellow. I think I warned you in the first part of the video that this page has um, a lot of colors that are kind of out of spectral order that we'll see particularly as we get towards the end of the yellows. They just kind of bounce around quite a bit. Next is Aurelian. I always say that wrong. I hope that's right. Um, this is actually the real Aurelian, I believe, um, not like a hue. I don't believe I have any other PY40s in my collection, although I could be wrong. It's a really beautiful middle yellow, but the catch is that this color is very fugitive, um, and so it's not really recommended all that much. No idea how there was dark pigment in that little bottom swatch there. I have clean water, or so I thought. Maybe there's some gunk at the bottom of my a jar or something. Um, but yeah, this is a really beautiful color. 
pretty sad that it's fugitive. I believe it gets darker, not lighter, um, when it becomes fugitive, so it won't be as light and bright as you are seeing here. Next we have, oops, I got paint on myself already. That didn't take long. Next we have Cadmium Lemon Yellow. This is the first of, I believe, three PY53, um, 53s, 35s, there we go. Uh, PY35, there's gonna be a couple. Depending on how they are treated, they will produce different hues. I know a lot of people ask about that. I can't remember how much of that we talked about in the first page. It's the trouble with re-recording footage is like, well, I know I talked about this at some point. Hopefully I'm not being a broken record for you guys. Um, cadmium yellows are going to be really intense, but they are also opaque. So you can see here, this is a beautiful bright yellow. Um, it's a little warmer than the lemon yellow, but it's also much, much more opaque. Next we have primary yellow. This is made from PY74, and this is like a perfectly middle yellow. And in my opinion, when you're setting up a palette after a couple years of experience with this, I first started with like a PY3 and then um, a PY65, which oddly enough, Sonili doesn't have. I think it's the first time I've seen that, but it's like a really deep orangey yellow. I had those two yellows on my palette um, so that I'd have the two different options for mixing. And honestly, over time, I've really come to favor a middle of the road yellow. I like PY154, but PY97 and PY74 are also good middle yellows. And, um, sorry, fidgeting with my little strips again so we can move on to the next color. Um, little pops. Sorry if that's loud or anything. I think it should be okay. Um, anyway, I prefer middle yellow and then like a golden yellow, like a nickel azo or something like that. Or maybe you can get your yellow orange. I don't feel like the cool, cool yellows have that much of a benefit for what I do at least. I'm not saying that for every painter, but for the types of paintings that I paint, which is wildlife, I don't seem to benefit from having a super cool yellow. The middle of the road yellow does just fine for me. Here we have our second PY35. This is a little bit warmer than the other colors we've seen so far. This is Cadmium Yellow Light. There's a little spot on the paper there. Can't really get up. Then we have Sennelier Yellow. Uh, sorry, Sennelier Yellow Light. This is PY153. This is very close to that PY154 that I mentioned, that I prefer. I don't have as much experience as PY153, but from my understanding, it's pretty close. Didn't get much of a gradient there, though. Let's try and soak up some of that color down here. Then we have a much warmer yellow. This is Indian yellow made from PY 154 and PY 153. So this is actually really curious because we're seeing 153 here and I know from experience PY 154 is about the same color. So obviously they must process one of those, if not both of them a little bit differently to get this really deep rich color. but I do like it. It's pretty transparent. And I believe, um, there's one other color that we'll get to in a few that's a little bit closer to PY65, but this would be definitely in the place of a warm color, a warm yellow color on your palette. 
Next we have Yellow Lake, which is PY150, and this is your Nickel Azo Yellow. And I did go ahead and try and look up some information for you guys, um, for myself as well, about lake colors. Um, I think that I mentioned it in the second page, but maybe it was in the first take of the first page that I didn't know, I didn't remember what lake colors were. I know I had heard it, but that I didn't remember. In Old Holland paints, it just means that they glaze well, but from what I read in most other brands, it's supposed to mean that they're made from dye-based pigments, I guess. Um, which happen fairly often, so I don't know why they use it for some pigments and not others. I don't know why it's here. Nicolazzo yellow is a, a nice color, but uh, they call theirs Yellow Lake. I actually really like this version of Nicolazzo yellow. It's a little bit warmer than some of the other ones that I've seen, and I really like that quality about it for my, my own purposes. Here's where we enter... Um, a pretty weird selection in the order of the paints from Sennelier. I know that's not that big of a deal, but it matters to me and it might matter to some of you. Just like when you're doing these color charts and you get pulled out of it because these colors are so um, different from each other. Because this color is similar to our other yellows that we've already seen. So I don't know why Naples yellow is stuck in here, but... We do have Naples Yellow, and theirs is a hue made from PY35, which is cadmium yellow, PW6, and PW4. So you've got a cadmium color and two whites, so this is going to be a very opaque color. And I don't really know what you would use this color for. I think some people would argue that you could use it as a base tone for Caucasian skin color, but I think there are better ways to do that uh, with more transparent colors unless you're going for like a gouache type of feel. So pretty useless color for me. I think you can mix that type of tone with other colors and then dilute it with water and then it'd be more transparent. But if you want the opacity, I suppose that's okay. And then here we have Yellow Sophie, uh, which is PY93. Um, and here you can see why I don't know why they put this in between. This is a really bright, beautiful middle yellow. Um, this isn't a pigment that I am very familiar with, so I looked up the name of it, and it is uh, Dizazo, D-I-S-A-Z-O yellow. So instead of Azo yellow, it's Dizazo yellow. Um, again, probably saying that wrong, but... <laughs> um, I'm going to try and pull some of our next color off of my little dot here. I really like it though. Um, I haven't checked light fastness on it yet. But I think it's a really pretty, very transparent yellow. And then next, we have Naples Yellow Deep. So in my opinion, these two colors should be next to each other. And after Sophie, or Yellow Sophie. Um, this is a color made from PBR24, and Schminka has this color, and it's called uh, Titanium Gold Ochre. And I actually have that version on my main palette. I'm not sure what kind of like drew me to include it on my main palette because it's not a color that I used very often prior to setting up my main palette. And I wouldn't say that I use it often now. I do find myself reaching for it sometimes. And it's a really nice, um, it's a nice single pigment that's somewhat more opaque than some of our other earth tones and has a little bit different feel to it when you're looking at certain um, subject matters. And I can't think of any off the top of my head that I'd use that for, but if you have one that you like, let me know in the comments below. I think that it would also be a good color for... Um, oops, oops, oops. I put my little plastic sheet down in the wrong spot. Um, I think it'd be a good start for some of your... Sorry, guys. These paints are so sticky. <sighs> my brain this morning. Okay, PBR 24. I think it's useful for, like, sandy colors, like, beachy colors. If you're not painting animals specifically. 
I think that's probably also a more suitable start for a Caucasian skin tone than the Naples yellow is. It has a little bit uh, more a natural feel to it, and if you water it down, you'd be closer to a Caucasian skin tone. Here is uh, our last PY35. This is Cadmium Yellow Deep. And this is similar to that Hansa Yellow Deep PY65, but we also have one more next to this one that's going to be a non-toxic version. Actually, I guess we didn't talk about it. All the cobalt colors are on this first page, so I would have talked about it in that first recording. Um, so cadmium colors can be... Um, well, they're always toxic. It depends on your perspective on how how much that impacts your style and your painting. With watercolors, we do use less paint than other mediums, so there's less of a toxicity impact, but there still is some impact, and I know some people argue, like, oh, why even bother? It's not that big of a deal. But to me, it is a big deal, and I would like to reduce my impact on the environment in any small way that I can, and by not washing cadmiums down the sink, uh, whenever I rinse out my buckets, that just makes me feel better. So I prefer to use non-cadmium colors. I also prefer tr more transparent colors, so there's no reason for me to be using cadmium colors when I prefer the other versions anyway. So these are two that would be similar to each other. This one is lighter and more yellow. This one is deeper. Um, however, this one, the hue more closely resembles the PY65 I was talking about, but they don't offer that in their line, which is odd and interesting. Next we have red orange, uh, sorry, cadmium red orange. Wait, nope, cadmium yellow orange. Got ahead of myself there. <laughs> I was like, wait, these names aren't matching up. So cadmium yellow orange, um, this is a very middle orange color. It's the truest orange that I think you'll see from uh, Sennelier. They don't have a PO62. I guess we haven't talked about that either. Sennelier has a relatively small range for a professional line of watercolors. They only have 97 or 98, I believe. Um, I'm not swatching out the whites on this sheet um, because they'd be hard to see and if I left them out, I had enough room to do uh, the rest of the colors on two sheets of paper instead of needing a little bit of an extra one. But um, they, they don't have a lot of common pigments that I'm used to finding in other brands, and they have more mixtures, which is just an odd decision, but that's their choice. And like I mentioned in the previous segment of the video, there are different brands for everyone depending on your preferences, and that is okay. So no P, um, PO62, this is going to be your closest color to that. Um, it's made from cadmium yellow and cadmium orange. Next we have red orange, and this is made from PO43 and PY83. Which, um, this color contains PY83 as well, but we don't have it on our own to look at. And honestly, I'm not that familiar with PY, uh, PO43, and I don't think I wrote it down. Um, but this would be your more intense red-orange. Between the two of these is going to be your true orange range, and then we're going to start moving into like really, really red-orange pretty fast. Um, there aren't a whole lot of options in this hue range. Trying to get this to flow a little bit better. Next up is Sennelier Orange, and let's see, plenty over here. This goes on looking just about red, like a really, really warm red. It does dry a little bit more on the orange side. It is made from PO73, which is going to be your um, pyro orange. 
But yeah, I don't know if the, I'm hoping the camera gets that look. It just looks like a really warm red here, but I can show you real quick. I mean, we'll do a comparison towards the end. It dries a little bit um, more on the orange side. Then we have Chinese orange. Um, this is a really nice earthy orange and this is a reformulation. The original composition for this contained quinacridone gold, which as we all know has been discontinued. So they've got their um, like quinacridone gold replacement in here. I will show you the original pigment in just a moment. I had a viewer named Allison who sent it to me uh, she sent me a tube of the old formula very early on in the channel. So thank you again for that, Allison, if you're still watching. She knew I liked quinacridone gold and she sent this one to me. So actually it's probably better to do this because this one is dry. You can see that the original Chinese orange just has so much more depth and luminosity to it and more of a brown undertone. I much, much, much prefer this one. But they do still have an option if you want something close to it. I do always prefer these earthier oranges over the bright oranges, as many of you know. Um, the last one that I have on this little piece of plastic in this row is French Vermilion. This is PR242 and this is not the original French Vermilion but I believe, at least according to handprint, Sennelier is the only commercial source of this in watercolor. So it's not a common color and if you want it you have to go to Sennelier for it. It is a very, very warm red, and it's honestly quite beautiful. Um, I don't know the light fastness one for this. I'll have to try that out. But just on first impressions, this is actually like vying for my attention from the normal pyrrole red that I typically use, which we'll see at the end of this row. Oof, I'm sorry my voice hasn't warmed up yet. Let me take a sip of water and see if that helps. I don't know if it's just allergies or if I'm getting sick. Um, my throat's been scratchy for several days now. Oh my goodness gracious. This is a messy one. All right, we go this direction. <laughs> I'm gonna put this just down below the camera here so it's not too distracting. Uh, but yes, allergies are, are coming for us. Spring sprung, sprung, spring, spring has sprung, it is springing. <laughs> um, here we have Scarlet Lacquer. This is another really pretty warm red. And you know, Sennelier is really well known for um, floral painters really loving their colors, and I can totally understand that seeing their reds. They have some really gorgeous red colors, and they're just really bright and clean, and paired with the fact that Sennelier is known for their glazing properties, I can just imagine how beautiful these would be in floral paintings. The next one is Rose Dior Matter Lake. Again, it's got that lake word in it, but I've seen plenty of PR 254s and 255s that don't have lake in it. So again, I'm not sure why the inconsistent naming there. But maybe one of you guys know. You can let me know in the comments. Um, if Sennelier has something a little bit different, just like Old Holland does. I don't see the lake naming in many other brands. It seems to be a European thing. Not all European paints, but I don't think that I've seen it in any American brands, but I could be wrong on that.
This next one is called Bright Red, and it doesn't have a pigment number, which is weird. But it is an incredibly bright, beautiful red. This is another color that I feel is out of place in terms of the spectral order. I think it should be placed after the Sennelier Red at the end of this row. Um, it's much cooler than the other colors that are around it. And I'm sure that if this doesn't have a pigment number and it has bright in the name, it's probably not light fast, but it is incredibly stunning. It was a gorgeous red. Hold on one second. Let me see if I move this. Aha. I move the light just slightly, and I think that that'll help with the glare. Next we have Cad Red Light, and this one gave me a chuckle because um, it completely, like, blew up and expanded in the color chart that Auto sent. Um, it's the only one that did that, but it spread out everywhere. And here's the the top of the the color there. It does have a lot of binder showing, so I don't know if this color would be a little bit different straight out of the tube that it comes from. We are back on a cadmium color made from PR108. Sennelier um, doesn't have as many versions of PO, PR108 as Holbein. We did the Holbein swatch through and they had tons, uh, but there is one more version on the next row. This is going to be a really middle of the road red. And here you can see we've got warm red, middle red, cool red, so I'm not sure why the bright red is in there, but it is. Next we have Sennelier Red, which is that pyro red I was talking about earlier. Um, I have this version on my main palette in Daniel Smith. This is a bit opaque. I mean, not opaque opaque, but I would say semi-transparent or semi-opaque for sure. And you can see it's a bit cooler. I still have this as the warm red on my palette because my cool red is more of a magenta. But as I was saying, I really like this warm red and um, may be interested in trying it out. Although I'd have to compare this to my transparent pyro orange from Daniel Smith because I always for, like I don't think of it as being a red because it has the name orange in it, but it is a very warm red, um, so it might be comparable to this color here. Um, next we have Perline Brown, and this is one that I just don't agree with the naming at all. Um, I like Perline colors in other browns, they're typically, or in other brands, um, they're typically made from single pigments, like you got Perline Green, Perline Red, um, this one is made from PR209, PY83, and PR179, which is a Perline color, but it's not brown. It is very much red, and so it makes sense that it's in with all of these colors, but it really doesn't make sense to me to call this a brown. It's a pretty color, though. It does deepen a little bit as it dries, but not enough to call it a brown color. Then we have Cad Red Purple. This is our other PR108, and it's going to be a much deeper version of that cadmium red. Then we have, um, I have to get out my next row of colors, but then we're going to be moving on to one of their Alizarin Crimsons. Now, Sennelier has three different colors that have Alizarin Crimson in their name. This is the true Alizarin Crimson, but it is accompanied by the word lake. P. 
PR83, if you're not familiar with it, is a fugitive color, although it is gorgeous. It is not light fast at all. So you have to be really careful with it. If you do journaling or sketchbook work that it's never going to see sunlight, then by all means, go ahead and try it out. But otherwise, I would recommend finding a similar color that has a better light fastness rating. And we're going to see several options here that you can choose instead. Um, the next one I'm going to have to go to the actual dot card for. This is another one that I feel is just completely in the wrong place on this chart. This is Venetian Red, which I understand has the name red in it, but this is an earth tone and it should be with the earth colors. And I think we talked about, like, um... There's the permanent alizarin crimson on this page. That's PR206. And like I feel like they easily could have swapped these two. This is still an earthy color, but that one is way more earthy. And um, it, it's just a weird choice. I don't think I've seen any other brand put Venetian red in with reds rather than earth colors. It's a very opaque color. When you tint out um, PR101 though, it uh, it gets this really nice, light, bricky, pink type of color. Then we have a lizard and crimson, and stop. Um, doesn't have anything on the end of it. This is not the true original crimson, though, as we mentioned before. It is a mixture of PR. 209 PR83, so it does actually have the original Elizabeth Crimson color in it, and PR179. So actually, hmm, this is curious. Oh, this is PY83, not PR83. I was like, those have the same pigments in them. It's really interesting because this is not at all what alizarin crimson looks like. Um, alizarin crimson, we can see right here, is a more pink color, although this is a very pink version of alizarin crimson. It's usually deeper and richer. Um, but this mixture over here is odd. Then we have carmine, which I'm going to go to the dot card for. This is PV19, and I would say that this is my preferred alternative to an alizarin crimson color. I use PV19 as my cool red on almost every palette. Theirs has a little bit of opacity to it, which is weird. It might dry more transparent, but I am not used to seeing PB19 not being perfectly transparent. All right, next up is Crimson Lake, and we are heading into territory that I haven't done these last three rows. Um, let me move my camera a tiny bit for you. So, and this area is where I messed up really badly on my swatches, so I haven't done these last three rows here. This is Crimson Lake. Again, we have PR209. It seems to be a color that they like to put in a lot of mixes. PR146, which I believe when I looked up that's a naphthol color. And PR206, which was the Eliz permanent alizarin crimson that we saw on the Earth Tone page. I really like this color as um, a cool red. I would have to play with it a lot more before I would know if it behaves 
properly in mixes, given that it does have multiple pigments. I get this question a lot too, and I try and answer it when it comes up on the channel, but just to kind of repeat it if you haven't seen my answer to that and are still wondering, it's not bad to have three or four pigments in a mix if that color still behaves properly, and if it works for you, that's fine. Um, the reason why a lot of people don't like multi-pigment mixes is because they can be less predictable when you are mixing colors. It's like there's a yellow in this red here, so if you're mixing it as a red, but there's a yellow in it, it might do something weird with its opposite colors or with other colors around it. Um, I, we don't know that until I would work with it. So they're just unpredictable um, unless you really know that color. So if you have a color that has three pigments in it, like don't throw it away, um, you can still use it and if it works for you and if you've never noticed a problem, it's totally fine. Um, but when you're putting together an artist palette and you have control over what you add to it, if you're gonna use say PR209 anyway and want that color on your palette, just get the single pigment version of it, which we've got here and then you can mix some of your other colors from it and still have the pure version intact if you need it. So it offers more flexibility. If you don't like mixing your own colors, then you can just get however many colors you need to, but you will need to buy more paint colors if, you, if you're not mixing. Um, I believe how I said it when I replied last to that question is like, if you have PR209, you can mix this color, but if you only have this color, you can never get back to PR209. And that's not a great example here because they're very similar. However, I do prefer the PR color. I think it's brighter and cleaner and is more attractive. And if I wanted to dull this down a little bit, I could just add a tiny bit of blue or I could add a tiny bit of like a dark green and it would mellow out just fine. I do have a uh, it doesn't quite cover those aspects, but I do have two videos that I might recommend for that. One is uh, the color mixing series in general, where we talk about mixing colors, but that's more about mixing our secondaries and browns and blacks. And then I also have one called neutralizing... I don't know what it's called. It's something about neutralizing colors, and that's when you're adding opposites to um, kind of mellow things out a little bit. If you want to check out either of those... Here's another PV19, they call theirs Rose Matter Lake, and this is a beautiful version of this uh, PV19. It's really, really bright and vibrant. And if I was going for just a regular split primary palette, I'd probably choose this color over this one. This one's a little bit deeper and more close. Actually, once this dry, this is actually really close to uh, an alizarin crimson lake. Uh, sorry, alizarin crimson, they call theirs lake, but this is very, very pale. Typically, they're deeper and darker, and this one is more representative of the color that I have seen alizarin, crim alizarin crimson represented as, whereas this is more of a quinacridone rose. Um, did I get to the end of this rose? Yes. Um, so we're done with this little strip here. I only got about uh, two and some change left. Oh no. Oh, this honey, let me tell you. Okay. So there is one color in the full Sennelier range that is not represented on this chart, and that is Opera Rose. Um, Opera Rose was not available in their full set for a little while. I've heard it's back, so if you buy the full range of Sennelier, you will have access to that again. But for a long time, it was not available in that set. Um, and so Otto didn't have it to send it to me. I have used it before. I had a sample of it a really long time ago, and I don't have any of it left where I would add the color in. But we're going to skip straight over to Cobalt Violet Light Hue. I've never seen this color before now, and re-wetting it, this color is gorgeous. Oh my gosh, it's so bright and beautiful. It's made from PV16, which is a mineral violet. Uh, PR122, which is quinacridone magenta. And even a white, but you know what? I don't see much of the white influence in here. It doesn't have the chalky appearance that a lot of 
colors mixed with white have, and we can wait and see when it dries if that comes through anymore. But oh my gosh, I love this color. It's so pretty. I wonder what I'd use that for. You know, it reminds me a lot of the hue of Rose of Ultramarine. Um, it has that really pinky undertone. Obviously there isn't the dark blue granulation here that we see with that color, but it, it's reminiscent of that color. I don't want to say it's the same, but it's reminiscent of that color. Next we have Permanent Magenta. This is another um, PV19, and I think it's our last PV19. And this is really showcasing the range that this pigment has. Uh, we talked about it, um, I actually really recently talked about it in my Color Spotlight recap video, um, pre preparing for the Color Spotlight reboot, um, went up last week. And I have all of my samples of PV19 out, and you can see the range from like the really, really deep ones, even deeper than this um, one up here, to all the way to this purple color. I have to say that I haven't used this much um, in my palettes because it's not a color that is called for very often in animal painting, but uh, I do like to use it when I'm doing my um, like really colorful animals. I have a video like with the Grumbacher paints. I used a similar color called um, Theo Violet from them and mixed that with like blues and teals and things like that. So it's still, it's still a color that I can find uses for when I'm doing the more colorful palettes, but I certainly wouldn't use it in a naturalistic animal setting very often. This next color is Cobalt Violet Deep Hue. So it's uh, PV16 again, which is Mineral Violet, and PR122. So it's actually the same combination of these without the white and potentially in different quantities because they're in a different order. But as I mentioned in the first part of the video, they don't seem super married to the idea that the color with the most influence has to come first with Sennelier's color. This is definitely a cooler purple. Probably, in all um, like honesty with myself, a more useful color, but I just like the hue of this one better. I'm a, I'm a red-violet kind of girl. I don't really like cool purples very much. But this is a very nice, cool, cooler purple. I would say it's pretty middle of the road. I could see how anyone could say it leans more blue or more red depending on the perspective on things and what it's next to. It's very transparent. Next we have Red Violet and most of the dot is on the page here. I hope Otto doesn't mind that I cut up her beautiful wonderful sheet of plastic. Um, it, it hurt me to do it from an OCD perspective, but it's so much more functional this way. It's so hard to keep removing the plastic across the entire page when it wants to pull up all the dots. So, gosh, there's cat hair everywhere. I keep moving and it keeps coming back. This is the Mineral Violet PV16 on its own. And honestly, we'll have to see how these dry, but these look very similar with this one being a little bit lighter in tone. Again, I would much rather have this PB16 on my palette along with the PR122, which we're gonna see next, and be able to mix a version of this color and have the two colors on their own, rather than having this convenience color. Uh, PR122 is a really useful magenta. I don't know what you'd use PB16 for because I haven't used it very much. But uh, PR122 is a very common color, and you can use it for a ton of different things. I'm not suggesting that if you have a like a mixed color that you really like, but like the pigments are not anything you'll ever use for anything else. I'm not saying in that case you should buy the single pigment, because if it's not useful, it's not useful. But um, if you have use for the single pigment on its own... I mean, I've already said it, I won't say it again. So this is called Helios Purple, but it's just quinacridone magenta. That's PR122. It's a really beautiful version of that color. It's really vibrant. 
The last color on this page here is Blue Violet, made from PV15, which is Ultramarine Violet. There's actually rewets really nicely for this color. This color can be really difficult to rewet. I know with Daniel Smith in particular, I've only used it on their dot card, but it was super, super hard. It's still going to be a really light color. It's not going to have a ton of tinting strength, but that's just the nature of the paint. Um, try and see if I can build this darker color. I could also see how this would be really useful for floral painting. All right. We're almost there, guys. Thanks for sticking with me. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry for the noise. Can you move this up a bit? All right, we have Dioxazine Violet, which is PV23. Now this one has a light fast rating of three. Um, with one being the best, so it's a really low light fastness rating. But again, if you want to check out that pre preparation video for the Color Spotlight series, I show you my light fastness tests, and almost none of my dioxazine violets faded. The Windsor Newton Newton one faded a tiny bit over three months, and this Sennelier one didn't fade at all, and it's a light fast three. So. Not that three months is forever and ever and ever and standing the test of time, but it was direct sun for that long, and um, I don't think you have to worry about this color fading on you, or at least nowhere near as much as people make it out to be. If you're an incredible artist and your work is going to be in museums for hundreds of years, then yeah, sure, you want to use a light fast color, but for most of our lifetimes... This color is going to do you just fine, and it's a really beautiful version of the color. All right, next we have Prussian Blue. It's funny that these colors are next to each other, actually, because also in that video we talked about the light fastness of Prussian Blue. Now, I haven't tested Sennelier's, but um, there's another artist on Instagram that has, and that link again is in that Color Spotlight reboot video in the description. I did test M grams and it is not light fast at all. And this one has a rating of one. Uh, so way better than the dioxazine violet and it completely, 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 completely faded. Um, I'm gonna say this this time and hopefully I don't have to mention it in another video because I've said it so much often, so, so often lately during all these conversations with Fresh and Blue that there's a discussion going on that if you, if it fades and then you pull it out of the sun and let it sit for a couple of months, it'll return to its normal color, which is a cool property. It's unique, uh, I believe, to Prussian Blue that it can restore its own light fastness in that way. But if you are selling work for your clients, I, oh, I shouldn't say you, I'll say for me, I am not comfortable putting a color that is going to fade if they leave it in the sun because I don't have control over where they put it. I can make recommendations. I can tell them, please don't put it in the sun, but I don't have that uh, like I don't have that control once it leaves my possession. So that being said, I would much rather just use another color that is close to Prussian blue that has a better light fastness situation for myself but I know a lot of people are attached to Prussian Blue, and again, if your work is not gonna be in the sunlight, if you don't mind if it takes a couple months to restore its light fastness, if you uh, are journaling, if you are working in a sketchbook, all of those situations, it's fine. If you wanna use it, use it. But if you are selling your work, I would recommend picking a different color, but it's your work, so you get to pick. All right, uh, this was Indigo here, and it's made from PB60, PB15, and PBK7. So PB60 is coming up here. We all know what Thalo Blue looks like, and then PBK7 is a black. Then we have our PB60 on its own. And Schmincke, 
Oh, sorry, not Shamika. Sennelier. Hmm. They might be every bit as good as the M. Graham that I'm in love with. We'll have to see when it dries. Um, I am in love with M. Graham's version of PB60, which is called Anthraquinone Blue, because it stays so much bluer and more vibrant than every other brand that I had tried with PB60. It has this type of color once it dries, so if Sennelier doesn't fade, let me show that to you in full strength there. If it doesn't fade, we might have something on our hands. Let's see if it, if it changes. All right, then we have our cobalt blues. First we have cobalt deep. And this is actually made with a different pigment. This is uh, PB72. So it's different than the PB28. Gonna give it lots of water to granulate for us. A little bit more pigment up here. See how that goes. Here is the PB28 version of Cobalt Blue. So it looks like the Cobalt Deep is uh, a warmer or Given the debate on warm and cool blues, it's the more red version, whereas this is a more green version. I feel like this one might be a little bit closer to ultramarine, but we'll have to wait till it dries to see. Here we have ultramarine deep, which is um, actually the ultramarine that I have on my main palette these days. Um, let's see, oh, there's some right here. Making sure I'm grabbing the right color. So this is the ultramarine that replaced my French ultramarine from Daniel Smith. Um, the Daniel Smith one dries really, really hard, and there was nothing wrong with the hue, but given that there are so many options for ultramarine, I didn't feel the need to stick with a version that I didn't like how hard they dry. Sennelier, obviously, with that honey, is really easy to re-wet. And uh, it's been great. Now that I've painted out that ultramarine, this definitely has more vibrancy and more depth than this Cobalt Blue Deep for sure, um, but this does have the red undertone more so than the other Cobalt Blue. All right, we just have two more. I'll just pull up the corner of this... Uh, this next bit, oh gosh, they're all stuck to the paper. They're stuck to the plastic. Um, but first up here we have French Ultramarine, which unlike Daniel Smith's single pigment version, this is a dual pigment. Sorry, there's paper stuck to the sample. I'm trying to get around it. So this has a the PV15 in it uh, right here. Uh, doing this one-handed is hard. You guys, it looks basically the same. One, it's confusing when companies do that because they're not that different. I guess it's a tiny bit warmer. but I don't feel like it's different enough to warrant a whole separate color, especially when Sennelier is missing some really basic colors, or common colors, I should say. Um, it does seem to be granulating more, so maybe that's the difference, and we'll see that more as it dries and as it comes out. We have one last ultramarine. 
These ultramarines did not want to travel. They are completely mangled. They stuck to the plastic when I pulled up the sheet, so they pulled paper with them. Yeah, that's that's beautiful too. I don't I don't feel like maybe it'll granulate more. I should wait and see cuz ultramarine takes some time to settle. But between the ultramarine light and the ultramarine deep, there isn't a huge huge difference so far. I do wish they would have put those next to each other and put the French ultramarine next to the cobalt. That would have been more helpful for comparison's sake. All right. So we finished putting all these out. I'm going to go ahead and let them dry and then we'll go ahead and do a recap and I will see you in just a few. All right, everyone. It has actually been a little bit since I turned off the camera because I went ahead and did a little glazing strip on each of the squares. Sennelier is known for glazing really well and so I wanted to be able to show that off, but unfortunately I um, don't think I did them justice here, to be like completely honest. This paper isn't wonderful, it's a student grade paper, and so glazing is a little bit harder on it and the paint just like sits at the top of the paper instead of sinking into it. So please keep that in mind when you're looking at this um, swatch chart that the Sennelier aren't going to be quite this clunky? I don't know, it just it looks a little clunky and I honestly thought the glazing would help sell the case of uh, Sennelier's just due to the fact that that's what they're known for but um, it backfired a little bit. So I apologize, I didn't take pictures before I did this, I should have, and uh, we're just going to kind of go through them. So I don't think that their PY53 is very, um, com like it, it doesn't look as great as the other brands that I've seen, although I don't have a lot of experience with this one. Um, they have a really great lemon yellow or cad yellow, depending on which one you want. They have a number of middle range yellows, so you've got like one, two, three, four, five, six, nope, not that one, so five middle yellows. You've got several uh, deep yellows if you want those. There's a nickel azo yellow here. Um, you've got a couple of the more opaque yellows, if that's your jam. We um, don't have a whole lot of oranges here. There's maybe three, depending on what you want to classify as an orange for, I guess, with the, the natural one here. Then we have a large range of reds, which is where Sennelier really shines. Um, I would probably recommend sticking more to the single pigment colors that we talked about during the recording of that second page, where you've got the ability to mix them. I really like the French Vermilion. Um, they have a really nice pyrrole red as well. I like both of their PB19s, although I like the rose a little bit better. And you've got a really nice uh, PR209 as well. Uh, you've even got a magenta, which is a little bit out of place, which is not uncommon. It should probably be over here in terms of its hue. Uh, we've got a really wide range of purples. Um, we've got three and six. So we've got six different purples ranging from a very, very reddish purple all the way to the deepest, coolest, darkest purple. Again, this dioxazine violet is rated poorly in light fastness, but has held up fine in my tests so far um, in the three months that it's been uh, in the window. Then we have a, an assortment of blues that continues on to the next page. Maybe we can show them off like this. Um, so you have quite a lot to choose from, from your dark blues. Uh, the Indian Throne didn't end up being quite as dark as Imgram, but I would expect that given the way that they handle the pigments a little bit differently. But it is a really beautiful PB60 that I really enjoy. You have plenty of options for cobalt blue. Um, so we've got these two over here that are called Cerulean, but are made from the cobalt pigment plus the cobalt deep. I think my favorite is maybe the cerulean blue, like the regular cerulean, or the cerulean blue deep. I like that lighter tone more so than the shade of cobalt blue that's more similar to ultramarine. You do have three ultramarines to pick from that are all really similar. Even after they dried, I don't see a whole lot of difference. I have the ultramarine deep on my palette, but I got that kind of sight unseen without comparing them to the other ones, so... Um, I don't know which one I would have chosen had I, had I compared them first. Uh, we've got a phthalo blue red shade, which is actually a really deep version of this color and quite comparable to probably their Indian Throne or their Prussian blue up here. Um, but this would be a more light fast version of Prussian blue. I think that's a really good replacement. You've got a really green version of phthalo blue. Um, I think that's uh, a nice 
change and it's very different from the red shade. We already talked about my feelings on Cenarius Blue. I know some people love it. Um, it's a pretty color on its own, but it's not my favorite and I probably wouldn't add it to a palette. I'd rather have a Cerulean Blue as my light blue uh, or even the turquoise green for, for Cobalt Teal. Uh, we have this Cornflower Blue that is called Royal Blue. Don't agree with the name. Don't really like the color, but I know some people really like that one. I really love these cobalt shades here, the green and the teal. Uh, the Thalo Turquoise is beautiful. The Forest Green is beautiful. We've got a couple different versions of mixtures with Thalo Green, but not a pure Thalo Green blue shade on its own. I would say that this one is going to be closer to a Thalo Green, whereas this one is going to be that really in between um, the Viridian and then the Thalo Green right in between the two. We've got a couple different versions of uh, Thalo Green Yellow Shade. This one having, I believe, white added to it because I'm not sure how, I've never seen that color that dilute before, but they didn't list the white pigment and then like they typically do with their other colors. Um, their Sennelier Green is the Thalo Green Yellow Shade without it. They also have a Cadmium Green Light, which honestly, this is really hard to tell from this one. So I would just get the Sennelier Green um, they're almost identical and this is a single pigment and so it'll be more reliable in your mixes. Um, we've got Hooker's Green which is a nice bright version of like a sap green. Um, then we also have, if we skip down here, we have kind of um, an earthy, granulating, almost a little bit muddy version of sap green down here. And then we have a really rich olive green. Out of those three, in terms of having a convenience green, I actually think I like the olive green where I was, I would pick like the forest green or the phthalo green and then mix other versions of green if I wanted a, um, a more blue version, I guess. We've got the green earth. Um, you can see here it had a lot of trouble glazing. It's already a color that doesn't have a lot of pigment to it. And so it was a little bit difficult to build up any kind of depth there. We've got two light greens here, uh, Thalo Green Light and Thalo Yellow Green, um, both made from Thalo Green Blue Shade and a yellow. Um, we've got several of these kind of brownish, brownish yellow greens. And so one is called Brown Green, one is called Brown Pink, and one is called French Ochre. This is definitely the last least green of the bunch and most yellow, but they all kind of fit in that same type of range. Once again, I would just recommend the single pigment. It's more transparent and this one is more opaque and they're very, very similar in hue. We've got a couple different ochres to pick from. Let me go ahead and move this one that we can't even see anymore. Don't know why I'm holding it. Um, we've got the light yellow ochre, which actually after seeing this dry between these two, I was really loving the hue of this one, but it did dry very opaque um, and more so than I was expecting. This one is more transparent. It's brighter. I'm not into having a dual colored um, yellow ochre on my palette, but if I had to only pick from Sennelier, I might pick this one. I would have to see how they do in mixes. Then we've got this really deep golden ochre, um, also opaque here, had some trouble glazing. The quinacridone gold uh, did fairly well. It's a bit on the orange side. You know what? I didn't pull something to show you, but let me see if I can pull out really quickly. I don't know where my swatch is of um, the real quin gold. I can pull out. Um, like cores in the stick version. I had these pulled out for the color spotlight video that I did and I'm not sure where I put the um, the true version, but here they are next to those ones. They're very comparable to the other versions. Uh, this might have a more uniform tone, so that might be curious to um, look into. A oh, big problem that I have with the mixtures for quinacridone gold is that they're orange here and they're yellow here, but this one seems to be more um, consistent throughout the wash, so we'll we'll have to check that out. We've got a pretty weak burnt sienna, and if we skip down here, all of their PBR7s are pretty weak as well. Um, I don't know that I could recommend any of those in good conscience if you have access to other brands. Um, but then again, in Europe, I know a lot of the European brands, I tend not to like the earth tones as much as I like American brands, so 
we'd, we'd have to go back, I guess, to the, the color spotlight, uh, or not color spotlight, the top five favorite series, and you can take a look at the brown video there for my recommendations. Uh, we do have an interesting red here called Permanent Illusor and Crimson Deep. Um, it's made from PB, uh, PR206, but it's much more red, and um, we can kind of put those next to these other colors. We've got the Venetian red over here that's typically an earth tone. These are very similar in hue. They're just different in their opacity. I really like the Caput Mortem. Um, I'll have to see how that goes in like mixing and actual painting. It's a really unique color, although the consistency of it was really awful um, on the dot chart. So I'd be curious to know if that's working, what it's like working from that fresh or from a pan instead of a dot card to see if the um, the binder being stirred into it would make it react a little bit differently. You've got two really nice uh, Payne's Gray and Neutral Tones here. Um, they're, they're nice, they're consistent. I don't have any problem with either of these two colors. Um, if you're really, really picky, this does have three pigments in it instead of two for the Payne's Gray and some versions have only two, but I think three pigments in either of those is fine and fairly typical. Not a Van Dyke Brown, um, this is fine. This is not a Van Dyke Brown. It is fine for uh, an earth tone. It does have a black pigment in it if that bothers you, but uh, it, it's a nice dark brown. I don't have a problem with it. Uh, the Warm Sepia is a nice deep brown, as is the Transparent Brown, but the Transparent Brown has some weird textural things that might be fixed by painting on a different surface. Um, it might just be this cheaper paper that it doesn't do very well on, um, but either of these would be fine. This is slightly warmer and more transparent. We've got a couple of gray tones here. I've got a very, very warm gray. Like, <laughs> it dries warmer than it did when it was wet. Uh, this is what I was calling my ring neck dove gray. Then you've got your pigeon gray over here, or light gray as they call it, and then kind of uh, an elephanty gray here with the sennelier gray. I don't think I'd ever put any of those colors on my palette to keep them there. I would just mix them up when I needed and dilute them with water instead of adding white, but they're there if you want them. They have their greenish umber, which would be kind of like a stand-in for perylene green, although I would rather use the single pigment perylene green. It also gets deeper and richer in value. And then we've got a couple of blacks. We've already talked about the lamp black. Um, is not actually a lamp black. It's ivory black with some uh, ochre mixed into it. So I don't love that choice there. But like I said, I like the Payne's Gray and the neutral tint, so I'd use either of those for my blacks instead of one of these. And then finally, we have the raw sepia, which is just a warm black, basically. Um, it's, it'd be really hard to call this even brown. It's so much different than, um, the warm sepia, but it is a nice warm dark color. So I hope that you enjoy that look at the Sennelier watercolors. Again, please keep in mind that this paper was not the best paper to showcase this paint, and for that I do apologize, but the hues should be fairly similar to what you would see on a cotton paper. It does appear that these paints want to be on cotton paper though, so I would make that recommendation if you're looking into this brand. Overall, I just hope that they were helpful in comparing colors. If you were deciding between various colors and want to build a palette for yourself, that this was maybe helpful. If you want to see those reviews, I have links in the description below. If you want to see specifically them in action and how well they glaze on cotton paper and all of that fun stuff. Thank you guys so much for liking this video. If you enjoyed the content, for commenting down below if you'd like to add to the discussion at all with any of the questions I asked throughout the video, for subscribing if you'd like to see more content, and hitting that bell icon if you'd like the notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons who help keep this channel afloat. I will see you in the next video where we are going to be starting our Color Spotlight series. Until next time, happy painting. <laughs>